I've got it. Thank you. All right. Dr. Sajad Fazal is a public health researcher in the Center of in the Cancer Epidemiology and Prevention Department in Alberta Health Services. His research focuses on three main areas: health promotion and misinformation, cancer prevention, and tobacco control. Sajad is currently working with a team of researchers across Canada studying COVID-19 misinformation. He has been featured on major news outlets, including BBC. CBC, Voice of America, and Global News Radio. Dr. Fazel is on a mission to support people's health to ensure they are properly informed during this time of panic. Thank you, Dr. Sajad, for joining me today. Thanks a lot, Catherine. I appreciate it. Yes. To give you a little context, Dr. Fazel, for the last two years, this podcast has been about fitness. I've been interviewing some of the top fitness and movement professionals in the industry about how fitness is a powerful access point to transforming all areas of our lives. But in the midst of a global pandemic, I shifted the conversation to meet the needs of my listeners, to make sure that they feel supported through this time, to have some tools to better manage the overwhelm and the fear and anxiety that is coming with this unprecedented situation, right? So I feel that our conversation today is very important. There is a lot of glorified media out there that runs rampant and is actually what I spoke about in episode 94 when I looked at how misinformation and the fear mongering around COVID-19 is figuratively a greater virus than COVID itself. Right. So, Dr. Fazel, I would love for you to share, shed some light on the research that you and your team has been doing around misinformation and COVID-19. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, we're currently studying um, COVID-19 misinformation and our research is still ongoing. We're looking at uh, the origins, we're looking at how it spreads, why people believe in it, uh, and sort of we are looking at what are the myths out there and what's the type of misinformation over there. At the same time, I spend quite some time on social media uh, debunking uh, the most common myths uh, um, and some of them which we will cover today. Hmm. Um, and I think it's important for everyone to realize that at this time, we have a lot of information overload and it's always good to take some time out from looking at social media rampantly to see what's up what's next um, because you have to filter the type of information you get some of it is beneficial especially those that come from the Public Health Agency of Canada from Health Canada um, and from well-known uh, researchers and uh, scientists uh, health professionals but there is a lot of information that is just being spread that has no value no benefit and is mostly just lies and myths yeah, no, I completely agree. Well, I know for me, as a general rule of thumb, I don't watch a lot of news before COVID-19. And especially now, I only look at the sources that are gather, gathered by fact, right? Whether it's our government, the Center of Disease Control, and the World Health Organization for me, right? And that's what I recommend to my clients if they are feeling overwhelmed during this time and, and sitting watching the news all day long, right? So I would love to know from you what you guys deem as the safe list to actually gather information from and those media outlets that maybe we should completely avoid if you can speak to that yes um, I think uh, if you look at it in general the first source and the safest source would be the World Health Organization as you mentioned the Center for Disease Control Public Health Agency of Canada Health Canada as well as the different chief medical officers of health in the various provinces right mm. they normally tweet out um, and provide accurate information similarly I think it's important to realize that there are certain um, newspapers um, and uh, publishing uh, um, houses that do produce accurate information such as the uh, Washington Post and the New York Times, um, they normally give uh, unbiased data. Of course, uh, CBC, CNN, um, and uh, Global News also give accurate data. Um, but when it comes to uh, political uh, views, that they normally have a left or a right. And I, I wouldn't go much into that, but they do give you accurate information nonetheless. The things to avoid are information from Fox News, for example. Yes. The things to avoid are information from Joe down the street who says this is a hoax. The information to avoid is uh, whenever somebody sends you a study or a research paper, and a lot of uh, times these days you see somebody taking a picture of a study and saying, oh, this research shows that hydroxychloroquine works, for example. Try to avoid that because when we make policies in general, uh, we don't look at one paper or one research. 
we look at a variety of research. There has to be high quality evidence mm. to inform policies. So when the Public Health Agency of Canada or the Chief Medical Officer of Health talks about something, they didn't just look at one study and say, oh, this shows this. But they look at a number of studies, they appraise those studies to see whether there's a high quality evidence or is it just a, a study which is flawed, right? So yeah. I think it's, it's good to avoid uh, saying that, oh, research say this. Well, was that research good enough? Right. Or is it just poor quality research? I um, mean, at the end of the day, when you go to social media, which is where many people get information from these days. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Um, yeah, unfortunately. But the benefit of that is we do have official channels on social media. Mm -hmm. I think as Canadians, we should be thankful that uh, our government um, and public health officials and uh, health professionals are actually online and ready to provide accurate information, unlike uh, some developing nations that don't have that, right? Right. Um, so I think... As long as you stick to those channels, you're safe. And if you do receive anything from a friend or a colleague, um, we have to change our mindset when we receive information. A lot of people think, oh, I received this. Who will this benefit? Who should I share it to? Right? That's, that's the process of thinking. I think we have to change the mindset and shift it to instead of who is it beneficial to, is it accurate? Right. It's true. And then think about whether it's going to benefit someone and you want to share it. But first step is, is it true? I think that shift in mindset. And if you do that a couple of times with information that's shared from, you know, grandma or a friend, and then automatically it'll be a habit for you to first of all question mm -hmm. um, whether it's true or not. It's not bad to be skeptical and to question whether what you're receiving is accurate or not. And then you can check it with the websites we mentioned. Those are excellent, excellent points. Because like you said, if we reframe the questions that we ask, is it true? Right. I think that will allow us to be more vigilant in the information we let pass by our psyche. And the other thing is, right, I think everyone needs to remember grade 10 science class, right, that when you had to come up with a hypothesis and put a theory out there, even in the preliminaries of learning science, right, it wasn't just based on one study, right, exactly. and we need to come back to those fundamentals that we all learned in school, really, of it is not, evidence-based research is a plethora of information and, you know, diluting it down and looking at what is actually relevant. So that is so, so, such great points. Thank you, Dr. Faisal. So there was a recent study in the uh, American Psychology Association that found that 66% of Americans are stressed out about the doom and gloom that is transpiring and that there is a strong correlation between stress and anxiety due to the constant consumption of news with so much misinformation being posted as truth right leading the experts in the mental health space and the general health space are seeing more anxiety depression and headline stress disorders than ever before and I know that a lot of money is behind media and I'd love for you to talk about who's actually benefiting from this min misinformation I mean Dr. Faisal honestly I've maybe watched Fox News five times in my life and I am personally dumbfounded, especially also as a Canadian, see it, it's a different side, right? right? So I would love to know, you know, I know you've spoken before about who's actually benefiting from putting out all this fear mongering. So will you speak a bit to that? Yes, sure. Um, and uh, you raised an important point. Um, well, the way I see misinformation spreading is there's two ways. One is somebody uh, getting information from a friend and saying, oh, let me just share it, unknowingly spreading misinformation. Hmm. But then there are those that actually create misinformation, those who actually create these conspiracy theories, right? The hmm. pandemic movie is one example of such a, 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 an act of creating a conspiracy theory. Hmm. Um, and so if you see these uh, people who propagate and create misinformation, they normally benefit from it somehow or the other either it's a financial benefit so those selling immune boosting pills they are earning from it those right. selling these miracle waters are earning from it um, the uh, second thing is those who are using it to gain popularity um, within their audience or within their base mm. um, so if you see a lot of youtubers um, uh, spread conspiracy theories um, just so that they can get more views. Now, obviously, for some, it's a financial benefit, but for others, it's just a getting popularity within uh, a group of people who believe in conspiracies, right? Um, mm. Conspiracy theories feed off of uh, the mindset that some people have. So if you already have this antitrust uh, or distrust for the government or for authority, uh, there is a certain uh, amount of likelihood that you would believe in conspiracy theories about COVID-19 being a planned uh, outbreak. Uh, similarly, I think uh, the third thing to remember is there are those that benefit politically, 
right? Mm -hmm. You'd often mm -hmm. see that politicians would use COVID-19 to sort of push their own agenda or sort of to rally up their base. The famous uh, person doing that is the president of the United States, for example. <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's, it's good to understand uh, and be cognizant of the fact that there are people benefiting from it. And it's, 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 it's not unhealthy to look at something and be skeptical and say, who's benefiting from it? Is it really true? Let me check with uh, what the official sources say and then weigh it out, look at the evidence and you will, you will see that the, the officials um, actually have backing of evidence while these conspiracy theories do not have a good science backing them up. Right. So I know you've become kind of a bit of an expert on debunking some of these theories around COVID-19. Truthfully, I haven't really heard any because I just don't participate in that realm of thinking to keep my energy high. But I would love for you to share, I guess, one of the most common conspiracy theories that you've heard and share with us what the evidence-based research actually speaks around this. And then I'm going to ask a question about what I've heard. Okay, yeah. Uh, so first of all, I, I just want to say to everyone listening that what you're doing by tuning out um, uh, conspiracies or tuning out the noise and just listening to official sources is a good way, by the way, to go about this. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to sort of uh, care for your own mental health. It's a good way to sort of keep calm. Um, and it's a good way for people to uh, keep away from all these uh, conspiracy theories. Choose your sources. You don't have to listen and read everything that's mm -hmm. out there from everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's not about what's the latest, it should be about what's the truth, right? Right, right. Um, so one of the things uh, that, I, that keeps coming up uh, as a conspiracy theory is that this is all a hoax um, uh, and that uh, the uh, virus is a bioweapon created by a man. So biotechnologists have done research and they found that it is not uh, man-made. It came from nature. Um, it was transmitted from uh, animals to humans. So this is a hoax. This is not true. Well, people are dying. So these are all, this is all a conspiracy theory. Hmm. The other thing that keeps coming up so much is this chlorine dioxide and whether people should be drinking chlorine dioxide. Well, if you drink chlorine dioxide and bleach, you'll have respiratory issues. You'll have liver failure and many other health problems. There is no evidence uh, that... Uh, chlorine dioxide will actually uh, uh, kill COVID-19. Some of these theories come from people uh, misreading science and sort of morphing it. So for example, we do know that UVC, which is a particular ray and frequency of UV light, we know that UVC um, is a germicide. And currently there is research looking at whether we can disinfect materials mm. using UVC light. Still research is going on. At the same time, uh, we know that high temperatures, which is why it kills COVID-19, right? Um, we do know that soap and water and uh, high concentration of bleach does kill COVID-19 on surfaces. But you cannot take disinfectants and consume them, right? There's a huge difference between things that kill COVID-19 on surfaces Correct. versus what you can consume in your body and what will kill you. Mm. So, so a lot of misinformation is in that area and in that group. And then finally, it's um, the, the whole uh, conspiracy about uh, medications and vaccines. Um, 5G is another thing that keeps coming up often. Yes, which, I've heard that one, yes. Yeah, there is no science based on that. Um, radio frequencies cannot transmit COVID-19. And if you look at the high quality evidence uh, of research, that uh, five, there is no evidence that 5G lowers your immune system. So we are not saying that these things shouldn't be studied, like sort of 5G's effects on health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, research should be done. But if there is no research, if there's no evidence or the research being done doesn't prove something, you can't make a claim that this is what we should go about, right? Um, so I think it's, it's just understanding that. Um, yeah, and that these are some of the most common conspiracies you keep hearing again and again. Right. So one thing that I would love for you to give clarity to is I've seen... Just recently, actually in the last week, by chance, somebody in my, uh, one of my friends on Facebook has been going around saying that he's not wearing masks and he's actually been almost abused, bullying people that have, saying that there is no evidence to support that you should be wearing a mask. Now, I was a dental hygienist for 10 years, so I technically have been in the front lines of infection control. And so my understanding is that with COVID-19, that a mask does actually protect people in the event that you are a carrier have it, right? And also, even though it's not the N95 for full exposure, that it is a barrier for entry, potentially, if you do expose, get exposed, if you're not in the six feet 
of social distancing. Now, I would love for you to share what the science is actually saying around that. Okay. Mm. So in terms of when, when you wear a mask um, and somebody coughs, will it protect you from getting COVID-19? There is no evidence to that. Okay. Um, your first point was absolutely right that if you do have COVID-19, wearing a mask stops your droplets from going farther away and infecting other people. So there is a benefit. So you wear a mask to protect me and I wear a mask to protect you. And that is how it works. And so you're right on the money with that. Um, and that is backed by evidence. What is the benefit of wearing a mask? Um, it is an incremental benefit, of course. Social distancing is the best way to go, washing your hands with soap and water, not touching your face. But it has this incremental benefit, which at a time like this is substantial, right? When you have the disease spreading. So I, I do think if you're going outside, do wear a mask because you may have COVID-19 without showing any symptoms. And we do know that you can go up to 14, 15 days mm. being asymptomatic. Okay, no, that's perfect. Perfect. So I strongly believe that our daily practices of avoiding media, for one, can either build up or break down our mental health resiliency during this uncertain time. I had a great conversation a couple weeks ago with uh, Samara Zelnicker, who is the founder of Mindfulness Matters. And we spoke about being more mindful as a practice in our day to day life, right? And that this actually supports mental health. And so those that are listening or watching, wherever you're viewing this, you know, one of the things that I always come back to are what are the practices and habits that you put in your daily life that allow you to get closer to optimal or that maybe are hindering your progress to move forward, even if it's a little bit, right? And one of the things that I would love for you to share, because, you know, in the health space, what does the research actually say around, you know, doing some health rituals that will support mental health, like avoiding misinformation? Right. Um, so I don't have the data exactly on avoiding misinformation. Um, I think there's a number of uh, researchers and psychologists looking at that. Um, but yes, we do know that uh, misinformation does cause fear, panic, and anxiety. And obviously, if you remove it, um, people will be much more calmer. So I think um, choosing the sources of where you get your information from is important. Um, the frequency that you actually look for information online, right? How many times do you check Facebook and Twitter? Um, I think that's something else to, to, to be mindful of. Mm. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and, and I've seen this in some of your previous podcasts where you speak with uh, uh, various uh, professionals who talk about yoga and meditation and mindfulness, and they have all uh, been proven to have uh, benefits in terms of uh, uh, improving your mental health uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the long run. And I think these are habits that would be wise for someone to have. It could be a hobby like painting. For some people, that's helpful. It could be a religious like prayer. I mean, it could also be uh, simply a stretching, doing yoga and meditating. We do know that exercise, for example, does reduce the stress levels and it does improve uh, uh, and sort of make somebody have an overall stronger immunity. Mm. So there are uh, benefits of uh, these mindful um, practices and meditation. And I do think that this is a good time to highlight them, especially when there's a lot of fear, panic and havoc. I um, mean, it's a good, it's a, it highlights the importance of these practices that some times aren't given the importance they deserve. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Thank you, Dr. Faisal, for your time today. And any final parting words, what you want people to remember from our conversation today? Yeah, I want everyone to remember that uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Whatever you get, first of all, check if it's accurate um, at this, and then share it if you really think it's accurate and beneficial. If it's not accurate, do not share it, delete it. Um, you don't always have to push back against people who share misinformation. If you can, go ahead. If you can't, it's okay. You don't have to stress yourself out. And just keep in mind certain mindful meditations uh, um, that in your podcast you highlight uh, that can actually help uh, their mental health. While we are physically distancing, we don't have to be socially apart. We can keep connecting through various means and coming together as a community and help each other out. I completely agree with that last point, especially. Meaningful connection can still happen during this unprecedented time. So I appreciate you and all the work and research you do and really being a change agent, talking about this as a thought leader so that people get clarity on what they should pay attention to and what to avoid. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot, Catherine. I appreciate it.